A boom boom. Hey, this is Time Bomb and Future. First time checking out the channel. Hit that subscribe button to catch all the updates. Thanks a lot for joining me here today in this video. It's a big one. I had Phoenix approach me a while ago and talk about wanting to do this dogfighting guide. Now, this dogfighting guide is part one of a, of a series basically to follow, and this really lays the foundation for how squadrons works on the dogfighting level, how evasion works, how shot tethering works, how the people utilize the tools available in game using comp targeting computers and different systems as well as the um, boost system a little bit here to to dogfight in not just Star Wars squadrons, but what I, what I like to call Fencar squadrons. So this is really laying the foundation now for the future installments as well. So it might be a little bit, you know, basic for for experienced players but there is information there that i think actually everyone will learn so i definitely recommend giving it a watch and it will sort of set the table for some future videos too what we're gonna do um i definitely have a few links down here in the description below as well in addition to what phoenix mentions i'm gonna mention um leaf's guide that he's put together about dogfighting on reddit here we're gonna link those below and he's also doing a lot of loadout uh, drops on facebook you may be involved in some future videos as well here doing some loadout work and neurotic tim for gray squadron has set up a guide that's really available now everyone if you're watching this and you're not on the gray squadron discord you definitely should be look at the um facebook group or wherever if you're watching this go to the reddit in the um the Wednesday <laughs> Wingmates, Wingate Wednesdays post, there will be the list of the different groups, and you should be there. And then when you're in Gray Squadron, in any channel, if you put Money Sign Bantha, you will get Neurotic Tim's Dogfighting Guide. So that will be available as well. There's lots of tools here for dogfighting in addition to this that you should definitely check out. Always recommend Fen Cards videos as well. And yeah, lots of practice time. That's what we all need. So thanks a lot for checking this out. I'm Time Bomb. You guys are awesome. And I will catch you guys later. Hi there, this is Phoenix1 and welcome to the Star Wars Squadron's basic dogfighting tutorial. This video is intended for players who are unfamiliar with space or flight sim games and will go over basic dogfighting concepts. If you're a more experienced player, a follow-up guide going over advanced dogfighting techniques in Star Wars Squadrons will be released later. But feel free to stick around, you might learn something new. I will go through the mechanics and theory of dogfighting in as thorough and comprehensive a manner as possible, and the general advice will be applicable to both the dogfight and fleet battles game modes. While I do have my own thoughts on the flight model and state of balance in the game, this series of guides will be focused on acting as a primer for how the game is currently played at a competitive level. Also note that this video will only cover individual play, team play strategies and tactics will be covered later. To start with, uh, the most basic advice I can give is don't die. Because of how the game modes are structured and given how important manipulating the morale bar is in fleet battles, dying actively harms your team either by reducing your team's time on attack or increasing the time on defense. Dying an excessive amount creates a huge handicap for your team that is difficult to overcome. So in general, you should be playing conservatively and trying to preserve your life by not suiciding for kills or objectives. Players who are alive and on the field can get kills, farm AI, do damage to objectives or defend them. Players looking at the respawn screen cannot do any of those things. As you get better at the game, you will learn the exceptions, but as a general rule, you should do your best to preserve your life and not die. And if you're low on health, you should always retreat to get repaired or rearmed. Let's talk about what you should do when you get into a game. Take the 5 to 10 seconds at the start of a match to redirect your power and make sure that at least your shields and engines are fully overcharged before you even get into a fight. Let's um, quickly summarize how each of the power systems work. When power is fully redirected into your engines, your speed, acceleration and turn rate are increased and the boost meter begins to charge. Having at least one bar of boost meter allows you to initiate a boost and from a boost you can initiate a drift. When power is directed into your weapons, your lasers charge faster and the amount of energy consumed when your weapons are fired will be less. If you already have a full laser bar, 
you can overcharge your lasers to do 25% more damage with each shot. When power is directed into shields, your shields charge faster and your shields can be overcharged as well to give you 100% more hit points. Generally, you will want to have all power to engines in order to dogfight better. Only shifting the power out is needed to recharge your shields and weapons. If you're firing on a target that is not particularly evasive, do remember to shift power into weapons. Doing so will greatly conserve your laser charge. Given how the power systems work, it is not advisable to balance out the energy. You'll want to maximize efficiency by allocating max power to each system as they need it. I would recommend starting out with basic power management, especially if you're new to space sims, and gradually move on to advanced power management as you get more comfortable with managing the energy systems in this game. When you do get into combat, remember to manually redistribute your shields as they get depleted because they do not automatically redistribute themselves. And finally, if you run out of power in any one system, make sure you have an escape plan in order to safely retreat so you can recharge. Speaking of escape plans, it can help a lot if you divide the map into safe zones, areas near your friendlies, and combat zones where your opponents and their capital ships are. Before you enter a combat zone, you should have your systems overcharged and you should be actively scanning for enemy players using your targeting computer. Assess the risk you are taking by going into this combat zone. Are you by yourself without teammates? What is the position of the enemy team? Is there cover like asteroids you can use on approach? Um, is the phase close to flipping? What's the morale situation like? Can you secure a kill? And after securing that kill, do you have an escape route in case things go south? The battlefield is dynamic, so just take a second and analyze the combat situation before deciding on an appropriate course of action. You'll find more success if you just think about what you're about to do uh, than if you just chase enemy players around mindlessly. Also remember that safety is relative. What was once a safe zone can change into a combat zone if the phase shifts and your opponents go on attack, and you need to be prepared for that eventuality as well. Reddit user Stiggy McCool made a Reddit post months back going over what I'm talking about here in more detail, which I'll link below in case you want to go over it for yourself. So far we've talked about the general higher level strategy to approaching dogfights. Now we're going to talk specifics about how to fly in ways that won't get you killed. So this should go without saying, but don't sit still and tear it up in open space. This leaves you a literal sitting duck. Unless you're taking advantage of your capital ship's shields by sitting under them, you should always be moving and not at a dead stop. Probably the next most important piece of advice I can give is don't fly in a straight line. When you fly in a straight line, you are really easy to lead and really easy to shoot down. Just don't do it. Let's take a moment to talk about leading your target. So, lasers in Star Wars Squadrons act like bullets fired from a World War II era fighter plane. Just like in the movies, uh, the lasers have a travel time before they reach the target and they don't fire instantaneously. To put it in FPS video game terms, the lasers are projectiles and are not hit scan. That means that if you fire on someone while your crosshairs are directly on top of them, at any angle other than directly in front or directly behind, your shots will miss because their spacecraft will have moved away from the spot you were aiming at because your bullets take time to travel to that spot. So to combat this, you should lead your target by aiming in front of where their nose is pointing so that your bullets will intersect their flight path as they travel. How far ahead you need to lead your target depends on how fast they're going and at what angle you're taking the shot from. In general, you always want to get directly behind your target the military aviation term is getting on their 6, named after the clock position, because that will give you the best angle on your target where you'll need to lead your shots the least, and while also not giving your target any shots on you. If you really need to take a high aspect shot, uh, a shot where your target is a sharp angle to you, you should roll so that your pitch, your up-down controls, are parallel to your target's direction of travel. The pitch controls respond faster than the yaw controls and you'll be better able to more accurately lead your target. The yaw controls are pretty responsive in this game though, so feel free to use the yaw if you just need to make small adjustments. Of particular note, your crosshair will turn red if your target is highlighted in the targeting computer and your lead is enough to indicate a firing solution that will hit the target. 
If your shots are close enough, the game will tether your shots to the target uh, to ensure that they hit. But different laser types will demand a different amount of pinpoint precision before that close enough point is reached. Personally, I recommend using the standard lasers for dogfighting since they have very strong shot tethering and are pretty forgiving. If you shoot at a target that is not selected by the targeting computer, the game will not shot tether to the same degree for you. You need to lead your target completely manually. However, the red crosshair does not guarantee that your shots will hit. It is just an indicator that if your target maintains the same speed and direction, the game will tether the shots to connect to the target on that heading. But if your target is rapidly changing direction and speed, your shots can and will still miss even if you have a red crosshair. It should be noted that your target doesn't have to be boosting or drifting, just rapidly throttling up or down is enough to throw off the shot tethering in this game. Also, any amount of latency or lag will give you bogus firing solutions where you will see the red crosshairs but your shots will completely miss and will not tether to the target. So that being said, your shots are still projectiles that when fired can connect to the target if they happen to move into the same space the lasers occupy. So do like Luke Skywalker, turn off your targeting computer and learn to manually lead your targets. Distracia did a lot of work on this um, and I'll link his document down below. So knowing all that, how do we avoid getting shot? Let's go over some basic maneuvers from real life air combat that are applicable to Star Wars Squadrons. To jink, just make a short, sharp, random movement with your stick and change the speed of your throttle. The objective here is to throw off your opponent's lead and spoil his shot. You won't throw off every single shot and bullet hose weapons like the rotary cannon will still make short work of you because the auto aim is that strong in this game. But you'll survive longer jinking than if you were flying straight ahead instead. The situation you're most likely to run into where you'll need to jink like your life depends on it is when you've run out of boost and have bandit or multiple on your 6 but still need to travel in a relatively straight line because you don't have a lot of room to maneuver. That said, it's good practice to be jinking anytime you're flying in a combat zone where you suspect bandits are about, if only so that you're already evasive and hard to hit when someone eventually does decide to start shooting at you. If you've played any sort of World War II flight combat game, this particular maneuver should be second nature. Okay, but if I'm jinking all the time, how do I lead my targets or lock on with my missiles or just hit things in general? Well, congratulations, you've discovered what makes World War II era dogfighting so compelling uh, and why Star Wars was based on that. So this fundamental contradiction is the basis for dogfighting in this game and many others. The best time you can jump on someone's six and take them out is when they're flying straight while they're shooting at someone or something else. So now we have to amend don't fly in a straight line. Don't fly in a straight line unless you really have to and the minute you don't have to, go back to not flying in a straight line. One aspect that is seldom discussed is the use of cover. So since this is a space sim, there's a lot more cover uh, available than in an atmospheric uh, flight sim, for example. Similar to first person shooters, using cover can be the difference between life and death. Most maps have a huge amount of cover that can be taken advantage of or structures that can be flown into or around. Even on the most open map, Yavin, you can fly into the clouds to break targeting locks and in exchange you will just take a small amount of damage for as long as you're down there. Smart use of cover will greatly reduce the damage you take, although you might have to be willing to take some risks. Okay, so you got into a dogfight and you're happily blasting away at some rebel scum, when suddenly your indicators are screaming enemy lock on and you start taking fire to your rear hull. Do you keep going for your original target? You think you just might be a second away from getting that kill. The answer is to always break off your attack and either evade or turn on your attacker. Remember, you're flying straight for the most part while you're attacking someone, and that makes you very vulnerable and easy to lead. When you're this vulnerable, you're most likely to get killed, and being killed means you fail to not die. If we want to win the game, we need to not die, so we can't have this, can we? Yes, even if that does mean you have to give up a kill. 
Again, this is a general rule and there are exceptions, but for the most part, you need to do your best to stay alive and not trade or suicide. Let's take a minute here and talk about the radar, your sensors and keeping situational awareness. The first screen we'll talk about is the tactical screen, which you can bring up by pressing the key that brings up the options menu. The tactical screen gives you a top-down view of the battlefield and displays where your teammates and opponents are. You should get into the habit of checking the tactical screen whenever you're relatively safe, such as when you're repairing at your frigates or when you're returned to the hangar, since the information it provides is valuable. That being said, it is admittedly a little cumbersome to refer to in the middle of a dogfight, where doing so is liable to get you killed. Next up is your radar. All ships have a radar display, although the precise location varies from ship to ship. Your starfighter has a sensor's range of 2000 units in a sphere around you, and the radar will display everything within that sphere. Contacts behind you will appear at the edges, while the innermost circle displays everything in front of you relative to your position. Contacts within the innermost circle are dead ahead. Teammates can extend the range of your sensor contacts and allow you to target bandits further away than 2000 units as long as those bandits are within sensor range of your teammates and are not using any stealth auxiliaries like the reflect hull. In terms of usefulness in keeping you alive, the radar is hot garbage because the displays are way too small. Its readability is awful, especially if you're a flat screen button masher like me. And by the time you notice a contact behind you on the edge of the display, you're probably already being fired upon. Honestly, I only find it useful as a method of reorientating myself in some of the more cluttered maps like Gallatin, because the friendly capital ships have nice big icons that take up all the screen space. Hugh SJ on Reddit made some handy diagrams visualizing how the radar works that I'll link below. The last and most useful screen is the targeting computer. Your targeting computer will display your target's orientation, your distance to target, their health and shield values, and any statuses they have such as ionization. You should have a key or button assigned to both target enemy team and target my attacker. Use your target enemy team key to cycle through the enemy team during normal flight and look for anyone whose ship is approaching you head on. They're most likely making a beeline towards you to try and take you out. If you come under fire, use Target My Attacker to quickly target your opponent and immediately start performing evasive maneuvers. Because the targeting computer displays your target's orientation relative to you, you can use that information to read your opponent and judge what they're doing and when they're lining up for a shot. Look carefully at the angle your opponent is at in the display, judge when your opponent is attempting to lead you and by how far, and use a combination of jinking boosts and drifts to foil your attacker's attempts to kill you. Remember that if your opponent is any good, they are doing the same and attempting to read you as well. So make sure you keep your movements short, sharp and random, because if you hold a turn or drift for too long, you might give your opponent enough time to correct their aim and end you then and there. So Squadrons is an arcade space sim, and as such does not have a particularly realistic physics model. Because of this, Evasive maneuvers that have clear trade-offs in terms of speed or positional advantage in a more realistic flight sim uh, don't have those trade-offs in this game. What does this mean? That anytime you find yourself in a real pinch, you should listen to my good friend, Peppy Hare. Do a barrel roll! By simply hauling your stick into a diagonal position and rolling in the opposite direction, you'll throw yourself into a barrel roll. What makes the barrel roll powerful as a defensive maneuver is that you'll be constantly changing your position in three dimensions while traveling in a useful direction, like say towards your capital ship and away from the bad guys. And because your nose is constantly changing where it's pointing at, you'll be quite difficult to lead. If you vary your speed while performing the barrel roll, you should be almost impossible to track at close range. The constant changes in speed and direction are enough to throw off the game's short tethering. Normally, in an atmospheric flight sim, constantly performing a barrel roll would bleed speed, and as all pilots know, speed is life. But since this is Star Wars, you can just barrel roll to your heart's content. Do take note that a barrel roll is different from an aileron roll. 
Due to how strong the shot tethering is in this game, doing an aileron roll offers almost no evasive benefits. While it does change the shape of your hitbox, at close enough ranges the shots will tether directly to the center of your starfighter's mass anyway. This is also the reason why the B-Wing's gyro function is basically useless, because the shot tethering will lock onto the B-Wing's cockpit even if the rest of the ship spins. Spinning is, sadly, not a good trick in Star Wars Squadrons. If you see someone constantly barrel rolling, lower your speed and open up the distance to your target until you're about 400 to 600 units away. Since it's easier to track uh, someone doing an evasive maneuver like that from further away. Judge where they're going, manually lead your shots and pray to the force that they don't decide to arbitrarily break off their maneuver. Which is to say, if you're using the barrel roll to escape, don't lock yourself into the maneuver and become predictable. Feel free to vary your throttle, break off your maneuver to jink normally for a while before resuming it, or otherwise do everything in your power to not die. If you do it right, you won't even need to touch your boost bar to escape. However, if you do boost and drift while barrel rolling, you do become really, really hard to hit. Playing in the background should be a short clip where I try to demonstrate everything I talked about here today in this video. To be fair to Time Bomb, he's using burst lasers which don't have the strongest shot tethering, but this clip was for demonstration purposes. So to summarize, don't die, don't fly straight unless you really have to, and do a barrel roll. Be sure to join us for the next video in the series, which will hopefully be a lot shorter, which will cover jousting. And with that, this is Phoenix1 signing off.